Hello, everyone, and welcome to SciComm Monday. I'm your host, Nicole Wood. Uh, for those of you who are new to uh, SciComm Monday, uh, we try to make this as an engaging a platform as possible. So feel free to uh, tweet in uh, all of your uh, questions, or sorry, tweet in, uh, um, answer or send them in via the chat module on Periscope, and that'll be the best way for us to uh, get your questions uh, during the broadcast. If we miss your question or you're watching this on replay, that's when we'd like you to uh, tweet in your questions uh, via our various handles so that way uh, we can answer your questions after the fact. So uh, for those of you uh, who are just joining us, please feel free to uh, engage with us as much as possible. And I'd like to introduce today's guest. Um, we have Dr. David Steen from the University of Auburn uh, with us today. His uh, handle is alongside a uh, wild. And with that, I'd like to say uh, welcome to the broadcast, David. It's great to have you here. Thanks. I've been so excited about this. Glad it's finally happening. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about your background out there for the few people who actually don't know who you are. <laughs> I am a assistant research professor at Auburn University. I study wildlife ecology and conservation biology, but my specialty is reptiles, particularly snakes and turtles. I uh, grew up in the Northeast, went to school up there, but I've been in the South since about 2004. Great. So uh, for everyone out there, um, we're going to make this uh, mostly about uh, your questions. So any questions you have for David, go ahead and start uh, sending those in uh, via the uh, chat module. So I'm going to throw something out there. So. Uh, we know a lot of your work via that uh, not a um, copperhead uh, Twitter handle or uh, hashtag. So how did that get started and how successful do you think that's been? Yeah, I've been doing science communication for uh, about 10 years now. And it started with my blog and then it just kind of branched out into these other uh, arenas like Twitter. And I really like Twitter because you don't have to wait for people to come to you. It's easy to find them. That's the key to outreach, I think, is bringing new people into the conversation. So what I can do is use Twitter to find people that are asking questions about snakes and don't know who to ask and, and then chime in there. Yeah, there's a lot of snakes that are mistaken for venomous species like cottonmouths and copperheads. So I thought making it a hashtag is just kind of a fun way to hammer home the idea that not all snakes are venomous and here's how you recognize the ones that are. As far as success, that's hard to say, but I know that there's a lot of people that are interested in snakes, learning about them, and some have even changed their perceptions of them. Yeah, uh, I know that's uh, one of the big things with outreach. Um, like, uh, I, I work with the invasive mute swan and uh, before I even started studying them, for example, my mother loves swans and she would always be wanting to stop at um, different lakes and things whenever we saw one get super excited. And once she found out that most of what she was seeing was invasive, she finally started changing her thought processes. And was like, all right, I understand, you know, we need to help advocate for our native swan versus the invasive swan that we have in here. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to be able to see people's, you know, mindset change as you're able to get the information out there to them. And I think getting it out there to them in a fun way that they can engage with is really important. Is that um, what you've seen as well with your work? Yeah, you know, it's, it's tough, especially with invasive species, because kind of what you're coming up against is the difference between caring about individual animals and conservation biology, which is the protection of populations and, you know, of, of native species. So it can be a tough balance. I try to encourage respect for all individual living creatures, uh, but talk about why conservation biologists are concerned about some of these invasives and maybe why they shouldn't necessarily be a priority for us or something that we spend money to protect. Yeah, we had, we had a comment uh, come in here saying how uh, somebody says that they have a lot of snakes around their home and they've never actually uh, bitten their dogs that they have out in the yard. Is that something that you find is uh, people have this 
innate fear of snakes and they're always assuming that if they see a snake in the yard that they're going to come and attack them and so they need to get rid of that snake out of that fear when chances are that that's not going to be what happens. They're just going to slither off and never bother you at all. That is what I try to tell people. I, I think that we have this innate fascination with snakes and sometimes that turns into fear. Sometimes it turns into you know respect and appreciation. But what I try to emphasize for people is that if you find a snake in your yard, it's not like a bear just wandered through and the situation has really changed. Those snakes are there the whole time. They've probably been there for years. You just happen to notice it today. and It's probably not as dangerous as it may feel. Uh, we had a question uh, come in from uh, someone here in Michigan saying that they fertilized their a lawn, what impact is that going to have on the snakes and turtles that uh, go through there? Uh, it's probably not going to be a big deal if we're talking about commercially available fertilizers that you can get in your neighborhood, uh, you know, garden store. Uh, the snakes and the turtles, they're going to be using the ground. The turtles are going to be coming up, nesting in it. Um, probably probably not using so much fertilizer that it's going to be harming those animals. I don't know the specifics, but I, I appreciate the concern, though. So with, um, with your outreach that you do, a lot of times we talk about people being on Facebook and Twitter. What platforms do you find are the most successful for you and where you can engage with different audiences with? Yeah. So there's a ton of different platforms, right? Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, things I don't even know about. Um, I really think it's possible to spread yourself too thin. So I pick two or three platforms and that's where I spend my time. I have my blog, livingalongsidewildlife.com, Twitter, alongside wild, and I'm on Facebook, uh, backslash living alongside wildlife. I think those lend themselves to the style of communication that I like, uh, sharing words, news, uh, and longer essays. I've uh, been hearing a lot about Instagram, so I'm thinking about getting into it. You're on Instagram, right? Yeah, I, I like using uh, Instagram a lot, I, just because I have a little bit more long form that you can do with the uh, pictures that you post up. So I usually try to put some more informative postings in there. So if I'm, you know, talking about a wood frog, I'll talk a little bit about their habitat or maybe, you know, how do you tell the difference between different types of tree frogs and things like that to let people get a little bit more information than what you can with Twitter. It, it's kind of like, for me, it's almost like that in-between thing between a blog and a Twitter post because you get that little bit more long form, but it's not quite as crazy as a blog. So. Well, maybe I'll check it out. Um, from what I hear, there's a lot of people posting pictures of snakes that they need help identifying there. So that could be an opportunity. But again, you can spread yourself too thin. We only have so much time, right? Right, exactly. That's that's half of my thing right now is how much can I do with the time that I have uh, with things. So um, we had a, a question come in uh, asking about, uh, what do you think about the rattlesnake roundups that they have over in West Texas? I'm against it. <laughs> you heard it here first. Let me be clear. I, I do not uh, appreciate these events because they glorify the killing of native wildlife. Uh, and they, they just, not only do they encourage the killing, but they just, it's the opposite of science communication and encouraging appreciation of, of our natural world. Um, so I, I, I do not like the rattlesnake roundups. They are important to local economies. That's true. However, you can do all of these festivals without the rounding up and killing of animals. And at least in the Southeast, many roundups have been approached and given assistance to transition into wildlife friendly festivals and a few have done that um, there's still a couple left though so I, I, I I'm, I'm sad that rattlesnake roundups are a thing 
Are they pretty much just like how it was on that old Simpsons episode where they're chasing snakes around? Like, I've never attended a rattlesnake roundup or any of those. Is it pretty much just like that for people who don't know what these are? Well, the the big one is Sweetwater. Okay. And that's that's pretty well organized. It's it's not people running around. Whacking day, I think, is yeah, what it's whacking day. Yep. No, I, I think that there's a, a certain number of rattlesnake hunters, and they do most of it. They bring them to these events, put them in pits and crowded conditions, um, kind of show them off, make them seem dangerous. They do cover some educational stuff, but it's it's just not worth it. And uh, advocates for snake preservation, uh, check them out. They they've done a lot of work to kind of provide another perspective on, on what really happens at these rattlesnake roundups. All right. So if, if you are out and you encounter uh, an animal, um, you know, a snake that might be, you know, in someone's backyard, uh, what's the, the best way to deal with that? Do you capture them and release them elsewhere? Do you send them to a rescuer if they're um, have issues? Like, I guess, what would you do if you came across, you know, a snake in your backyard? I would take a picture and, you know, just watch it and observe. These are native species. They're, they do cool things. They're going to be hunting. They're going to be regulating their body temperature. Maybe they're looking for a place to hide. So I just think, I think of them as like a, I would a bird visiting a bird feeder. I, I just kind of um, observe them. But I do get a lot of calls from people that, see snakes in their yard and are concerned and they ask me to remove it and generally I'll, I'll just talk about how these are harmless species you know for everyone you see there are many that you don't so removing it doesn't really do anything uh, but that said if, if it's a, a venomous snake and they're concerned I'll, I will relocate it for them yeah it's I think that's one of those things like you you see more videos and stuff being posted out like I just saw one uh, last night uh, from, uh, I think it was either the government of Ontario or it was someone up in Ontario posting a picture about how if you find baby rabbits in a yard, you should just leave them there because chances are they're fine. Same thing, I'm thinking what you're saying with the snakes is if you see one, it's fine, enjoy it, but leave it alone and everyone will be happy. Absolutely. But, you know, common sense is important. If, if you've got a timber rattlesnake in your yard, you're probably not going to want your kids to be playing around in your dog out um, but you know, just because you see one doesn't mean there's another that you don't so I kind of encourage try and encourage people to just have snake sense you know watch where you're putting your arms and feet and if you're living in snake habitat then be snake aware um, so a reminder for everyone out there watching, if you have any uh, questions, definitely feel free to send those in via the uh, chat module here on uh, Periscope, and we'll do our best to uh, get David to uh, answer all of your uh, snake and SciComm questions. Uh, so uh, talking about a lot of the outreach that you do, how much time do you actually spend on your outreach? You know, how much of your week does that take? Because that's always the big question I get with people when they're getting starting into psychon. They're always asking me, how many hours per day or per week do you put into it? So how much do you put into it? I put more time into it than I think most people would want to or are able to. And so that's my dirty little secret. I'm not exceptionally skilled at this. I'm just willing to put in the time. And, and you know, it's not necessarily... I sit down and I say, I'm going to do science communication for two hours now. I'll, you know, if a question comes in during the day, I'll answer it. I might go online, procrastinate a little bit and, and see what's going on. Uh, I really liked TweetDeck because in the previous iteration, I was able to schedule tweets. So I could answer 20, 30, 40 questions and then just schedule them to appear once every 10 minutes. So I had this kind of continued presence online, but I could be watching TV or at the gym or something like that. Yeah, I like TweetDeck as well. It, it definitely does help with my time management of it. Without it, I feel like I would be glued to my phone most of the day sometimes, so. Yep, yep. But to answer your question, you know, a couple hours a day is, is probably about right for me. Um, 
So since you're a professor at a university, is that considered part of your job program or is this something or your job description or is this something that you do outside of that just because you uh, like the aspects of science communication? It's not a formal part of my job. I'm an assistant research professor and much of my salary is funded off research grants and my job is to do that research and, and do stuff related to that. And the case can be made that science communication should be a component of any research project, but at the moment, it's not. Uh, so I generally do this on my own time, but during the day, sometimes I'll um, log on here and there, but I, I try not to let it uh, take away from what I'm getting paid for during the day. Yeah, so we had a question come in asking if the communication that you're doing, is that more educational, and I'm assuming educational for like uh, the, the audience out there, or are you doing more communication on your own research? Like how much of a, a mixture is it? Uh, I'm not a, my research is on basically wildlife ecology. So the science communication is separate from that. I try to communicate the results of that research, uh, but, but it is, it's kind of separate. Okay, so you're more educating the audience out there with your science communication, not using the science communication to advocate your research as much, would you say? Oh, okay. Yeah. The, my primary motivation for being online and doing this is education. Okay. Outreach. And that said, I'm not uh, shy to do a little self-promotion as well. So I'm happy to let everybody know about some new research that I, I got going on, and, and so I, I won't hesitate to do that as well. Right. Um, like, we were talking a little bit earlier about how much time you put into this, and it's outside the scope of your job as a professor. Do you actually get compensated at all for this? You know, is like, how do you help fund these initiatives? Because, I mean, it takes time. There's, you know, other resources and stuff that go into this. Like, how do you generate funds to help cover this? Or are you throwing this all out of your pocket just for the goodness of science yeah well you know first of all I enjoy it I appreciate it and, and I like the opportunity to uh, provide a source of information and be on call for people I, I, I feel like that's very war rewarding on its own uh, that said it can be hard to justify the amount of time that I had been spending and, and like I said I've been doing it for about 10 years and, and, you know, the job market for the day jobs is, is very competitive. And so time spent doing science communication isn't necessarily time spent furthering your career. So I needed, I, I convinced myself I needed some kind of justification. So I joined Patreon, which is kind of a crowd funding platform. And it allows people that appreciate your work uh, to kind of chip in on a, on a monthly basis. And, and I've been really you know, pleased and humbled by, by the support I've, I've received there. Yeah. Um, I, I know you convinced me to uh, sign up on there, and it's something that I found that was really easy to do and an easy way to, uh, you know, help, you know, get that um, additional support because it does. It, it takes time and resources to do this, and I think as – we get further and further into this, it t seems like it takes more and more of our time and we have to find that ways to help support it. Cause like I like going out and doing those field work live sessions. Well, it takes money to drive out there and things. And, you know, it takes away, like you said, from your other jobs. So you have to find ways to justify that. Um, do you think it's ever going to be where universities are having professors that they put that into their job description? And so that's, part of what you get to do and you get compensated through the university from that versus having to find these outside funding sources? I think so. And, you know, many of the land and sea grant universities have extension offices. And so those professors do a lot of really important work. Um, I'm seeing more job ads for, you know, the research teaching faculty. I'm seeing more show up with uh, the people saying that they have an interest in outreach and science communication. I don't think it's really caught on. 
uh, you hear a lot of people telling academic researchers that and teachers that they should be spending more time doing science communication and outreach. Um, but I think those messages should go to the people on the search committees, people on the tenure and promotion committees, because right now, first of all, there are a lot of people doing science communication. Um, we don't always hear them and they're not always uh, recognized and rewarded for that work as it is. So before we start telling everybody else to be doing science communication, we need to acknowledge that we're not really uh, appreciating the folks that are doing it right now. Yeah, do you, do you think there's still some of that sentiment out there in the sciences that science communication is just a bunch of people playing around with cat memes on Twitter and Facebook versus the actual like benefits? Like, you know, what other benefits do you see just besides educating the public that you've had with science communication for your career? Well, one benefit is that I've learned a lot. You know, people ask me questions. I don't know this stuff off the top of my head, so I'll often have to look it up and, you know, do some research. And not only the answers to individual questions, but I learn about what people are interested in, uh, what they're curious about, and what they don't know. So that's been, that's been really rewarding. Um, as far as professional benefits, I now get invited to speak more about science communication than I do about my research. Uh, so I, my profile has definitely uh, increased as a result. I, I can't really point to tangible professional you know, rewards or achievements based on science communication, but I know it's opened up a lot of doors, increased my profile. Yeah, I, I know with myself too, like all the symposiums and talks and everything that I've been giving this year are all on science communication versus my own actual research. And so it's kind of opened up that avenue of things. And I, I know other people out on the uh, Twitter sphere um, has, uh, um, here, I'm gonna switch over because I'm actually was gonna be talking about this person who just sent in the question. So you see that there's a shift in talk invites um, that you're uh, getting uh, with people. And I might not have caught all of the questions. So if Ariel, if you want to like resend that question in, that'd be really good. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, like Ariel was one of the people that she actually had um, research publications come out of sending a post up on Twitter saying, hey, I've got this data or does anyone have data and I can help them out with. And so there actually is that like research you know, background. Do you see that with anything that you've done? There, there are those opportunities. I, I have done a couple large-scale papers that required data from a lot of different sources, and social media can be useful in helping getting the word out. Uh, I haven't done that recently, but yeah, there are there. It, it's great for that. Um, another thing that that reminded me, another thing that happens is, you know, now that I become a person that people send their observations to, sometimes they send me things that are new or haven't been documented um, with the you know, academic science route, you know, Western route. Uh, and that could be animals seen in places that they haven't been seen before. That's native and non-native species. That's uh, people seeing a creature eating something else for the first time. Uh, and that could be novel. And so I've helped those people publish those observations in natural history uh, journals. And so that's been really great. And uh, last fall, someone sent me a video of a cottonmouth and a copperhead fighting. Uh, usually they do this for mates. And that was the first time two different species of snake had ever been documented fighting before. And so we turned that into a note that was just published in Ecology, which is a, a good journal. Um, so that, that's been really neat to work with citizen scientists and get their word out. Yeah, so it's like you're kind of like on that cutting edge of everything that's happening and you get it even faster than what you would if you're going to a conference because I always have thought of like, you know, conferences are like that, you know, you get that quick flash in the pan of like, hey, this is hot off the press. You know, we just finished our research this summer and we're talking about it this fall. But with science communication, you're finding out that day, hey, we saw this out in this lake and, you know, here's that observation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ariel's question that she nicely uh, resent in for us was she's asking, how do the higher ups, uh, at your university, how has, uh, um, what is their thought processes or how have they responded to the fact that you have this shift in the talks that you're giving? So you're not giving so much research, you're giving more SciComm. Have they been 
um, okay with that? Or are they, you know, kind of like, mm, I don't know, I think you should do more research talks. So first of all, I have to make sure that what I'm getting paid for is done and I'm doing a good job. I need to be publishing those papers. I need to be writing those grant proposals. As long as I'm doing that, I think that uh, they would say it's okay to be doing some of this other work. It's not a part of my formal job description, but they do value it. Um, they value that I, I'm reaching out to the public and getting the word out. And also, I'm also putting Auburn University in the news and on people's radar a lot. So I feel pretty comfortable with my publication record. And if I didn't, I may have a different philosophy towards the time I spent on science communication. But at this point, I, I feel comfortable branching out and doing some of this other work. So it, is that one of the big things that you see with people when they're actually um, getting that okay from their universities or their agencies is that publication or that publicity that they're giving to those institutions through their science communication that that's maybe like the avenue to take with advocating for it when it comes to, you know, doing it on your job? Every situation is different. Uh, the job descriptions are going to be different. Your higher ups are going to have different philosophies, but I think it is often beneficial to highlight how you're raising your profile and how you're raising the profile of your uh, institution. I, I think many people value that. Um, so what would be like your like, I don't know, maybe like three biggest, you know, pieces of advice for someone getting started in SciComm? Like what's the like the first three things that they should do? Set reasonable expectations. Uh, I think that we hear a lot of calls for people to just start doing science communication, get out there. And, you know, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to build up that audience uh, to find your voice. So I think it's it's possible for people to get on there and then they only have a few followers. There's only a few people viewing their blog and, and you just kind of need to do it for years. Uh, so set reasonable expectations. The other thing is that don't take advice that doesn't work for you. Uh, especially if this is something that you're doing on your own time. The key is consistency over a long time period. And so if you try to make yourself into a science communicator that you're not, I think you're often going to get burnt out. Uh, so find your own voice, find what works for you. Um, so those are my two top things. And maybe I'll, I'll think of another one as we keep yeah, for uh, everyone out there, uh, we have a, a few minutes left here. So if you have any questions, uh, please uh, send them in now via the uh, chat module. Uh, we definitely uh, love hearing all the questions that have been coming in. And if you um, are able to get your question in, uh, feel free to uh, tweet us uh, after uh, the broadcast. So I know that you do a lot of snake stuff and turtle stuff. Do you do any other research? with other uh, species out there. Yeah, most of my work lately is with snakes and turtles. I think a lot of people would be surprised that half of my dissertation was on birds. Uh, that, that's, oh, see, you're yeah, surprised. Yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> there you go, yeah. Um, so I, I consider myself a wildlife ecologist and conservation biologist in general. Um, but other things, other things, you know, besides amphibians and reptiles, do do sneak in there. Uh, my main projects right now relate to indigo snakes, uh, tegu lizards from South America, and then my grad students are working on indigo snakes, flattened musk turtles, uh, snake fungal disease. Um, so that that's the general idea. Yeah. Um, do you find that? It's, it's nice to be able to branch out a little bit into other species and that it, it helps you when you go back to those main, you know, snakes and turtles, like you're finding that information out here, you know, with this different species and it, you know, you can relate it back to your own work. Yeah, for sure. Because I'm, I'm interested in broad questions and community ecology and conservation. And so uh, those things aren't necessarily specific to uh, certain species. So I do like to be able to generalize, and you always learn something new on these projects. Okay. Well, any last thoughts about uh, snakes or science communication that you want to throw out to uh, the audience out there? 
just that I'm happy to, you know, talk about this stuff on Twitter, Facebook. Um, Twitter's pr probably the best way to have a back and forth with me. Um, so I hope to see everybody there. Great. Well, I'd like to thank uh, David for coming on the broadcast with us today. It was uh, nice to be able to snag you while you're off in the middle of uh, Colorado. So, yeah. That's right. Headed to Rocky Mountain National Park right after this, and so I'm, I'm pretty excited to see some bighorn sheep and elk and mountain lions for sure. Well, there's the perfect excuse for you to get up on Instagram. You could post all those pictures for us. So That's right. That's right. Look for me there. <laughs> Not yet, though. So uh, for everyone out there, uh, please, uh, if you uh, weren't able to get any of your questions with David, uh, definitely tweet him at Alongside Wild. Uh, and then if you have any questions uh, for myself or for the broadcast, uh, feel free to uh, tweet me either at SciCom Monday or at my personal handle of Wildlife BioGal. And then uh, next week, we're going to be having Dr. Joanna Huckster on. Uh, she deals with uh, how the public perceives climate change. For, so for all of you who are interested in how to talk to your friends and family, either in person or through social media on Facebook, about climate change and how to help them understand uh, the impacts that climate change is having on our environment and our world, uh, you definitely are going to want to tune in for this because it's definitely one of those in the news uh, moments, especially with the whole uh, Paris Accord um, issue going on right now. So uh, please uh, tune in for that. And then if you are a fan of SciCom Monday, uh, please help us out to uh, help us keep sharing all this science and be able to get all these amazing scientists and SciComers on and to help us to be able to get out and showcase uh, your field work. So please visit our Patreon uh, site and um, please uh, just any help you can give. Uh, helps us to keep this broadcast going. And then with that, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, tuning in. I hope you had uh, fun and learned a little bit about science communication and uh, the cool things with snakes and turtles. And uh, have a great rest of your day. Uh, go out, do some science, go explore, have some fun, and hopefully uh, we'll see you at the next SciCom Monday. <laughs>